And good morning, everybody. Welcome to Family Citizen Science slash Be an Explorer. I'm super excited about today's segment. Uh, we have Dr. Vanessa Basi from Costa Rica who will be talking about what she's observing in her backyard as well as her work with sea turtle conservation. And we'll talk a little bit also about how what we can do here in South Dakota to help maybe not the sea turtles in Costa Rica, but other wildlife that lives way far away from us. So good morning, Kim's family. Good morning, Scott's family and Kim's family. Yes, we'll be seeing some pictures of baby turtles here in a moment. Uh, let's bring Vanessa in and so we can say hello to her. Good morning, Vanessa. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so you are in Costa Rica and you are in quarantine as well there. Yes, I am. Okay, yeah, just like us up here. Um, I am, yes. It's been difficult as I'm sure. So um, we are going to just jump right in. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And um, we're going to talk about your work in Costa Rica. So here is sort of the rock star of the sh of your work and the show. Tell us a little bit about this critter. Absolutely. This is a olive ridley sea turtle hatchling. Olive ridley sea turtles are listed as vulnerable. They are in risk under risk of extinction as most of the sea turtle species are. Um, and we are at the second most important site in the entire world for the olive ridley turtle. Um, here in Ostjanal, we get um, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of turtles that nest simultaneously in these short periods of time, maybe three or four days. And we call this an eribata. Um, it's quite a spectacle. It's like a mass nesting event of sea turtles. And um, our our site is, is you know, almost unique in the world for this. Only a handful of sites in the world have this. So uh, this is a sea turtle sanctuary and we see more turtles here than you might see anywhere else in the world so uh, we expect a big bulk of our observations around here to be of, of turtle hatchlings on the beach or um, adults in the water people know uh, this picture was taken here and i'm going to um enlarge this and then i'm going to scroll out so that blue square is where Vanessa is and the turtles are roughly. And let me go ahead and slowly scroll out. The internet's being a little clunky. So all these orange dots are sea turtles. And so you can see there are quite a few of them down here, but it looks like they go, or the olive ridley sea turtle. Oh, oh I went too far. Um, and so we are up here and you're down here. So we're sort of connected by the Missouri River into the Gulf of Mexico into the Caribbean Sea. Okay. Um, so these are sea turtles and your work is in sea turtle conservation. I'll enlarge this picture too. What can what is what are some of the threats to sea turtles? How can we uh, help sea turtles? Those are like two similar but different questions. Well, there's threats vary greatly by. Overall, sea turtles are primarily threatened by commercial fisheries and things that are out at sea. Remember, we usually see sea turtles on land when they're nesting on the beach, but they spend most of their lifetime at sea. Um, so things like marine debris, plastics in our oceans, all of the fishing gear that we call ghost nets that get left out. Um, turtles are getting entangled in these things and drowning or they're eating plastic um, and basically starving to death. So those are the two uh, biggest threats that um, 
may sound overwhelming, but that every one of us can really make a difference at home, uh, being careful what kind of seafood you, you eat. If you do eat seafood, looking for sustainable sources of seafood, uh, buying from local fishermen and smaller fisheries, um, and being really conscious of your use of especially single-use plastic and the way that you're disposing of your waste and uh, learning more about how it's getting managed because those are things that on a global scale are impacting our oceans. Yes, we've talked quite a bit on our, our live stream here about picking up trash to protect uh, sort of the wild pollinators and uh, the wild lands that like the butterflies and the bees use and to keep the plastic away from them. But I think what is also I'm hearing you say is that um, plastic on land can get washed into the ocean. And even here in South Dakota, we are about as literally as far from the ocean as you can get in North America. And it still can get washed into the Missouri River, get broken up into little pieces and washed down all the way into the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. So picking up our trash, not, well, first of all, not making it and then picking it up, that's something we all can do. And I really like your idea about being careful about the seafood we eat. Um, our community has a really nice walleye fishery nearby. And so if we eat uh, fish, we could go out and catch it ourselves, learn how to fish, um, support conservation in our um, communities. So we have a couple of questions already. And Scott's family is, why are most sea turtles in danger? And you kind of touched on that. I think this is probably due to a lag. But let's go over those again, because I don't think we can talk about this too much. Uh, the, the biggest yeah. thing about putting sea turtles in danger. Um, yeah, I think the, the I would kind of list uh, maybe four or five top ones. The first is is commercial fishing, um, but also any type of illegal take, uh, killing of turtles, for example, hawksbill turtles for their shells. Um, there's still a lot of places in the world where eggs or adults are, are getting killed um, and used as food or sold on the black market. Um, the rest is, is um, kind of larger scale uh, marine debris. Um, which means plastics, litter, anything that will end up in the ocean. And uh, climate change is actually a huge threat. Um, you may not know, but sea turtles' sex is determined by the temperature where the nest incubates. And the males are at a lower temperature, the females come from higher temperatures. And so with climate change, we're seeing uh, way more females than males. And when these nests reach a temperature that's above this um, kind of range that they're usually used to, then it's actually lethal. So we have a lot of sea turtle eggs that don't even hatch. They're dying before they even hatch just because of temperature. So climate change is another one um, that's a little bit harder for people to understand. Um, I think, what can you do as one person? And so it's it's a lot about um, trying to live more sustainably and it's something that um, pretty much all wildlife is is uh, you know threatened by now. Um, so those are the, the bigger ones that I would really point out. Those are great answers. Um, Danica's family had a question. How can we help turtles with plastic on them? And I'm guessing they're thinking of like those really horrible, sad photos of turtles who you see wrapped in plastic so much so that it deforms their shells. Yeah, well, the biggest thing is, again, avoiding single-use plastics. A lot of the photos that you see of these animals, it's one single-use plastic item. There's a, a, a video that went viral of a sea turtle with a straw up its uh, nose. We've also seen a turtle with a fork up its nose. These are items that someone used for maybe 15 minutes tops and threw away. Um, and can completely be avoided. Um, so that's the first step is avoiding it getting in the water at all. But if you do find an animal, definitely um, contact you know a local vet or wildlife rescue um, to make sure that it gets handled proper properly. Um, some of these, if it's external, you can really just kind of cut it off and set the animal free. But if they've eaten it or ingested anything, it's really important they see a vet because there might be surgery needed. You can't just like pull something out of an animal's intestines like that, um, it could really hurt them. So you have to be really careful. Um, so the best thing is to call um, call someone for help and, and see if you can get that animal to a rescue center to get rehabilitated and hopefully 
sent back out to the ocean once they're better. Uh, before we move on from sea turtles, and if anybody has more questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get back to them. But um, one of the things I saw that with the quarantine and the beaches being so empty, the sea turtles had a lot less stress on their on their hatching and movement to the sea. Was that, was that in your area or was that someplace else? Uh, it's been on the news kind of a little bit everywhere. I think that um, a lot of us are really looking for hope at this time. And so conservation and wildlife has, has gotten news kind of all over that this might have a positive impact. Unfortunately, um, that's kind of a one-sided view. There's also a lot of negative impacts from uh, this quarantine and, and you know, this global um, pandemic that are putting wildlife more at threat. Um, so not having presence on the beach in really isolated places means that there's more poaching, there's more illegal activity going on, and there's no one there to regulate it. Um, it also means a lot of these conservation projects rely on tourism um, for income. A lot of the volunteers that work with us are coming internationally. So it's um, a little bit uh, there's pluses and minuses. I think that there's definitely some things that sea turtles will benefit from. Uh, coastal development, the presence of humans on the beach, especially at nighttime on beaches where there's nesting is um, something that has a big impact, but we also rely a lot on, on the economy, on, on tourism and on volunteers. And so a lot of projects are struggling right now as well. So if someone, when this is over, wanted to go visit a reserve or someplace like that and see the sea turtles in their communities. There's a way they could do that so it doesn't hurt the turtles and it helps the people who are trying to protect them. Yeah, definitely. Um, support the projects, go visit the conservation project, learn about it and make a donation. Um, a lot of these projects won't even ask for donations. They'll be happy to, to show you around, but know that um, if they're investing their time, you should really support them. Um, there's going to be a huge need for, for that kind of support once this is all behind us. Well, that's really interesting and helpful to know. And for those of us who uh, are love sea turtles and love the ocean, uh, even though we don't live near it, I, I think we all are looking for ways to help and make good happen in the world. So. Uh, so you can pick up trash, you can find sea turtle play, uh, sea turtle organizations to donate to, um, and keep the good going forward. So oh, one last yeah. question um, before we move on, or and we'll probably keep coming back to sea turtles. Uh, Scott's family is, why do turtles lay their eggs in the sand? Well, that's a good question. Um, so most reptiles uh, lay their eggs either in the dirt or sand. Um, and sea turtles are, are kind of unique since they're marine. They spend most of their time at sea, but they still rely on land uh, for, for the reproductive phase. So they lay their eggs in the sand and bury them. Um, and this is kind of a way they tend to kind of camouflage the nest to hide it from, from potential predators. So they'll kind of smooth the sand out and bury it. And you may very well, if you've been to a beach um, anywhere, possibly have stepped over a turtle nest and not known it. Um, and they don't need any type of um, help from their uh, mother. They can hatch on their own and come up to the surface and go back to sea. Yes, and for those of us in South Dakota, I was once um, kayaking along the Missouri and we stopped and we dug a hole in the sand because we were going to build a little fire to have a campfire and we accidentally unearthed a snapping turtle nest so we covered it up very quickly oh, yeah. and <laughs> dug someplace else but we even have turtle nests in sand around here so just be mindful when you're uh, down by the river and digging in the sand um, if you see a yeah. little round leather golf ball that's what a snapping turtle looks like egg looks like uh, just put it back. Yeah, sea turtle are so yeah. <laughs> Let's go ahead and look at some of the other cool things that you have in your backyard. Uh, we've been looking at warblers um, and robins and butterflies. 
uh, bugs, uh, spot bees. Next, oh, by the way, everybody, we're talking, we're going to bring Dr. Bachman back next week and talk about spiders. But here is, I can't believe you actually have this in your backyard. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> this is a mantled howler monkey. Um, they're a pretty small uh, um, monkey. They're not, uh, uh, they're, they're hard to pick out in the trees. I usually see them because the branches are moving. This is a wonderful picture. One of our top observers in the area, Laura, uh, works actually at the refuge for wildlife um, rehabilitating monkeys. So most of her pictures are monkeys. And they're just, I love, um, I love this picture because it just uh, really, is something that we see often. Uh, you'll either see them moving around looking for leaves or flowers. Um, they eat primarily, uh, you know, small fruit from trees and, and they're uh, vegetarian. Uh, and then they'll rest. So this morning I ran outside because I saw the, the trees moving. I got excited. I might be able to show you them live. Um, the monkeys are up in the trees. They found a tree that's flowering um, and they were snacking on it all morning. But when I went back just before our live stream, they're already all just kind of laying down, lounging, um, having kind of their lazy mid-morning nap. Um, so these are really common. And what is very special about them, they call them howler monkeys because they howl. Um, they're extremely loud. I'm not gonna try uh, replicating the sound because I'm terrible at that, but um, it sounds like what you would imagine a gorilla might sound like. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, loud noise that travels really far for this such a small animal. Um, so that's usually what I wake up to in the morning. They tend to howl around 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. Um, and they move around in groups. Uh, occasionally we see a group of 10 to 15, sometimes up to 30 individuals. Um, and they're just incredible to watch. They're so um, agile in the trees. They use their tails to swing around and reach for the flowers and plants that they're eating. So um, they're definitely one of the top observations we have in the area. And obviously so, they're, they're really fun to watch. Uh, Dr. Jane Goodall, who is, she worked in Tanzania um, on chimpanzees. She is famous for starting out her talks with the call of the chimpanzee. So uh, I don't know, maybe when you become as esteemed and elevated and well-known as Dr. Goodall, you'll have to work on your howler monkey but, uh, imitation. Um, it's quite, <laughs> it's, it's quite yeah, well. here. here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's look at this next critter here. This is another one of my favorites. Um, it's really common around here. Um, probably the most similar thing that you've seen where you are is a raccoon. Uh, they're from the same family and they have pretty similar behavior. Um, so we tend to see a lot of these here in Costa Rica. They call it a pisote. Um, but it's real, uh, the common name is white-nosed kawadi. And um, they are usually either just a male that's alone or we'll find sometimes a female with, uh, or several females with all of their babies. They're really cute to watch. Um, you might have seen some memes or funny videos. They uh, stick their tails straight up when they walk around. And if you look at them walking backwards, they kind of look like dinosaurs. It's strange to think but um so they're they're very funny um and they can climb trees they're super agile they have a similar tail um to monkeys i mean they can really kind of grab things um and uh these guys tend to similar to, to raccoons get into uh if you have like trash outside or if you leave something one day i left my cat food outside and found a mess the next day um so they're kind of similar to raccoons in that sense they they come out at night and they're troublemakers <laughs> Wow. Okay. Uh, next. So what's, this is, wow. This, look at this bird. This is fascinating. Um, I have never I seen a bird. bird. It's one like of that. It's a beautiful bird. It's called the turquoise browed motmot. We have a few different species of, of motmot here in Costa Rica. It has a very distinct call, um, kind of similar to an owl hoot. I can maybe try this one. It's like, whoo, whoo. Um, and it's spaced out pretty widely. It's a pretty deep tone, so maybe I didn't replicate it that well, but I can always hear it and then I have trouble finding it. But um, usually, obviously, the bright colors are stand out when you're looking for this bird. Um, they're interesting because they burrow in the side of kind of small hills. So their nests are actually burrowed. 
And one of my favorite anecdotes about this bird is that um, I have a guidebook that has kind of folklore stories. And the folklore is that this was kind of a very vain, beautiful bird with beautiful feathers. And that's a big storm came and all of the other birds were getting ready for the storm. But this bird uh, was lazy and stayed in its burrow, but its uh, tail feathers were sticking out and they got destroyed. So all of the birds made fun of him afterwards. <laughs> Um, I always remember that story, um, but this is, it's a gorgeous bird. It's one of the top observed in our area. Um, and it's, it's very iconic, I think of around here. Um, it's always really cool to see. It's beautiful. Um, oh my, this, <laughs> what is this? I had to include this one. Uh, this is the green iguana. And this is a male uh, during the mating season. They, they, you can see it doesn't really look green. Actually, in this picture, it looks much more orange. Um, they get very bright coloration uh, during mating season. And so um, something I didn't particularly know about iguanas when I first moved here is that they, they can really change their coloration. I've seen an iguana um, just throughout the day look darker or lighter. And so the males get really bright orange in the in the mating season. Um, these are super common around here as well. Uh, one of the top observations in the area. Um, the babies can, we find a lot of juveniles that are much smaller, but the adults, I would say, are maybe up to three feet long if you include the full length to the tail. Um, so they're, they're very big. They're not very short. Um, sometimes they go swimming in people's pools <laughs> um, and they like to, to find a spot to kind of lay out in the sun. And um, the one I have one near here, we nicknamed her Joanna. She comes out every morning to eat butterflies. <laughs> oh, she eats butterflies. Oh, oh, well, I guess I guess the guanas need to eat, too. So um, yeah. Yeah. now just just to repeat, because it's easy to forget, we're, we're used to seeing animals like this. Um, in like the wild back, you know, exotic areas. But these are all like in your backyard, you know, just very, you, you keep saying yeah. the most common. Um, wow, it's making me want to go to Costa Rica. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's an incredible place. You know, this is one of, this is a biodiversity hotspot. It's where we have, I think Costa Rica hosts I want to say it was 3% of the biodiversity on earth is just in this, this small country. So it's teeming with life. Um, and so really anywhere you go, any hotel or house that you're staying at, you're likely to see animals in the yard, if not even coming into the house. Um, I've had snakes wander in or crabs. And so um, as a biologist, I really enjoy it because I'm always seeing new things. And um, I've always running for my camera to do a report on iNaturalist. There's a lot of really cool insects, especially. Well, we are learning to love insects here. Uh, we're starting with bees and then we're going to go to spiders next week. So um, maybe in a few years, we'll have some, some of our viewers who will be ready to come down and help you with identifying and learning about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, what is this? So I had to include this because this is a very special observation. This is a jaguarundi. It's a small wild cat. Um, it's a little bit just big enough that you realize it's not a house cat. It looks like a black cat when you see it, um, like it would just be a regular house cat. Um, but it's a little bigger. And what's really interesting about this cat is that it has a very distinct face. Uh, you can see it's kind of rounded nose. So it, it looks a little bit more like a bear face than a cat. Um, and they're um, really rare around here, especially the area I'm in is, is pretty developed. Uh, but we do see them occasionally. Usually someone sees it crossing the road at night. Um, so we do have some wildcats here in parts of Costa Rica. We even have jaguars. Um, but here in the area, we, we see this one and there's another one like an, called an ocelot that has uh, coloration more similar to uh, a jaguar um, or maybe a leopard, if you've seen one of those or heard of those. So um, yeah, this is a very, very special sighting. We're really excited to know that we have small wildcats here. Um, it really is a good indicator of the health of our ecosystem. Nice. Uh, and this one, uh, this is, oh, go out so you can see everything. What is going on with this critter? I wanted to include this one. Yeah. 
Yeah, so this is a cormorant. Uh, when we when we first met, you were mentioned that you guys have cormorants up there. These are really migratory birds, um, and we see them uh, on the coastline here often. Uh, they dive for fish, and they're actually really agile in the water. It's um, impressive to see them. And this, uh, I thought this was a really special picture because you can see it's eating a fish that looks like it won't even fit inside its throat. Um, and they're they're really good. They're good at fishing. Um, so we see them a lot on the beaches here and, and these birds might be flying all the way up to, to where you are. Yeah, I wanted to show you something about cormorants. I did some research and most of the cormorants we have here that uh, migrate in from South Dakota are the double crested cormorants. However, I'm going to um, First, I'll turn on the satellite view because that makes it more interesting. And then I'll go to the full screen. And these are all neotropic cormorant. Each little orange dot is an observation of a neotropic cormorant. And this is kind of slow and clunky. But here we are. And here I clicked on this little dot right here, thinking, oh, that looks like about that uh, where we are. Let's see. What that is and oh yeah that's when we click on it we can see the observation was made it's a neotropic cormorant and we can see it was made by kelly preheim who was our um guest yesterday so oh, that, really uh, yeah so that is so cool she observed a neotropic cormorant that might have come from where your preserve is um so yeah. that is, so i just i just think about sometimes just how this wildlife connects the whole world you know our mm -hmm. our air of course and our water moves all over the world but animals move all over the world too we have a couple of questions. Uh, Scott's family is asking, what is an ocelot? You mentioned that with the Jagarundis. So tell us a little bit more about yeah. that. Um, I'm wondering if you can look to see if there's any observations on iNaturalist to show a picture. So an ocelot is a similar, similarly, it's a small wildcat. Um, and it has kind of a yellowish orange coat with black spots and, and lines and designs on it. Um, it's a beautiful cat. It's a nocturnal cat um, that's uh, seen in, in a lot of Costa Rica. And we've seen it in, in the area here before. Um, there's a hotel that they found one um, hanging out in the tree. Um, so it's a, uh, I'm hoping, yeah, hopefully here we can see. It's O-C-E-L-O-T, I think is the way. It's spelt. Um, so uh, it's also a, a very, very rare sighting um, in general, but we do we do see them here in the area. You are about here near Capos or uh, we are a little farther north We're on that northern peninsula. Okay. Yeah, Punta Uclita, maybe right around here. Yeah, we're a little farther north, but we could look at that observation. Okay. I don't know that we have any observations from here yet. It's usually one that we see, but we don't catch a picture of it. <laughs> All right, let's just take a look and see what this observation looks like. Oh, that's a pretty good one. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's such a beautiful cat. See what you're, I can see what you're um, mean when you say it, it looks like a leopard. Um, yeah. Because the coloring does look very leopardy. We have a question about uh, going back to the um, cormorants is, are they amphibious? Yeah, I guess, um, so they're not amphibians, but I guess you could say they are amphibious. They uh, they can swim in the water. Uh, you actually, I used to see them often kind of drying their wings off after they've caught their, their meal for the day. 
Um, so oftentimes you see them out in the sun with their wings out to let them dry after they've been in the water. Um, so yeah, they do spend, um, they're, you know, as I mentioned, they're super agile in the water. Um, you would think they're like a sea snake sometimes when you see them because you just see the, their neck sticking out um, and they're incredible divers. So this has been so fascinating and so informative. And the thing I love about iNaturalist is that these are pictures that you know, people not not professional photographers have taken, although some of them are professional quality, um, but just regular people where they are sometimes going to a special vacation or a, a special nature area. But um, so we can all contribute to that and enjoy and help each other enjoy our the wonders of our world. So, well, yeah, and it's, it's super important also that there's there's scientists all around the world using that data. Um, so especially here in the area, people that come visit, most of our observations come from tourists that are visiting and they're super important to help us learn about the wildlife that's around um, all of these incredible places. So thanks for having me. You are so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if there are any other questions, put them in the chat and I will make sure that uh, Vanessa sees them, please. We'll put a link to her conservation um, reserve, preserve. And so maybe you can go visit that and maybe throw them a little bit of money too. So have a great day, everybody. Stay curious, stay safe, and go explore. <laughs>